Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. Uh, we have to move quick today because uh, Jason's only with us for a little bit of time, but then we'll probably continue the show uh, once he has to leave. But we're bringing back a Talk Gnosis tradition that we've been neg neglecting for too long, which is answering your, you, your questions uh, about Gnosticism, topics related to Gnosticism. If you have more questions, uh, this has caused questions to float up in your brain, uh, please send them in. Uh, Jonathan at GnosticWisdom.net or leave them on our Facebook or tweet them at us or put them in the uh, uh, comments below the YouTube and uh, we will answer them. And of course, I'm going to put a little asterisk here. Our answers are not necessarily the, the be-all and end-all. Uh, it is our personal gnosis that we are sharing with you. Um, and uh, Jason, have you, 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 you're a white middle-aged guy. You listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, <laughs> have you ever noticed, okay, you go out for a run in the morning, you pop on your headphones, you can't even get through a simple religion podcast without somebody trying to pick your pocket. All you want to do is enjoy your run, get a little bit of information, get a little bit of distraction while you're while you're washing the dang dishes. That... You know, I I find I'm trying to escape the archon of commerce whenever I listen to these podcasts, and it, and it follows me everywhere. Yes, it's very frustrating. So. <laughs> patreon.com slash gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you can actually put a cap on that and just give us a buck if we get enough patrons i'll stop doing these commercials the other thing as well is if there's something that you want from us for your patronage email in what we give is early access to the shows and of course it allows us to keep doing the shows if all the patrons stop giving us money we'd probably have to stop doing the show uh we are the world's first guest supported podcast uh, you, the the 50% <laughs> of our patrons are former guests. I think, uh, Bishop uh -huh. Tim included. <laughs> so we hopefully, uh, it, 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 it's an interesting title to have. So hopefully we will, we will, you know, should be the other way around. We should be paying our guests. Like, like Nick Lachetti would have a mansion by now. If we were paying our guests. Uh, you too, Tim. <laughs> yeah. You'd be sitting on a solid gold throne right now. <laughs> okay enough fun stuff time to get to the fun stuff here is a question from no one which is n-o-e uh, underscore w-u-n it's actually a bunch of questions and i understand that the tim wants to uh, take the the first bat at this <clears throat> <laughs> there's something i've been wrestling with for some time that i would like to see addressed if the true God, the monad, is all-powerful and all-knowing, why would he create Sophia and allow her to create the Demiurge? Or at least, why didn't he warn her not to create the Demiurge? Also, if also, if the true God isn't all-powerful and all-knowing and didn't know that creating Sophia would lead to the situation we were faced with, then how is he not ignorant as well? Like, how is he any different from the Demiurge? I'd like to say that's a great question, but actually it betrays a incredibly profound misunderstanding of the material. Um, however, the great thing about those kinds of questions is that it enables the, the, the person you're asking the question to try to correct some of those problems. There's two big issues in the in the question that is being asked. Um, the no, high no, um, is positing that the well, there's a whole chain of misunderstandings here, and most of the misunderstandings come from taking the assumptions that you get handed from mainstream religion and, and interpolating them onto the Gnostic material in it because you assume they're the sort of standard background. Because the material throws around Hebrew and Christian terms like uh, God and so on, um, we just take what we've got from the background that we came from and we sort of paste that over the top of what we're already reading. And that leads you to some really deep misunderstandings of what it is you're reading. So none of what you're saying there is in the text. I'm, and I'm taking this from the secret book of John, right? The Apocryphon of John, which is the, the kind of, um, the kind of ur text for Gnosticism. The, there's later stuff where maybe you could get away with this kind of interpretation, but you really absolutely can't in secret John. And if you did, you've not read it correctly. So go back and read it again. Here's, the, here's some of the key things. So at no stage does it say that the monad is all-powerful and all-knowing. Um, what you haven't listed in that list out of the classical lists of God's attributes are benevolent. So there's an assumption in this entire question that God is meant to be benevolent. And so there's, uh, there's an interpolation over the top of the nature of the monad that the monad should be benevolent. Um, and that's an assumption. 
I put it to you that with the picture of the monad that's painted for us by all the material that uses the term is that the monad contains all things. It is the ultimate ground of being. It is the, it is the ground of all phenomena, the ground of all non-phenomena. <laughs> it is the, the one transcendent thing that contains all things. So if it's the one transcendent thing that contains all things, how can it possibly be benevolent when the entire definition of benevolent is a human construct? It's a thing we make up to judge each, other, each other's behavior according to moral codes. Or to put it another way, it's a demiurgical construct. Mm -hmm. The notion of benevolence is a demiurgical construct because it comes from an era in religion which was about moral codes and getting dumb people to line up in rows and do what they're told. And that's not the picture that Gnosticism is giving us. The nature of the monad is to contain all things. So let's just throw the benevolent thing out of the road. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it says that what's implied in the question or stated in the question is that the, the monad creates Sophia. The monad does not create Sophia. That doesn't happen anywhere. Um, the monad seeks to know itself or the, the monad in seeking to know itself manifests the father and Barbello as a binary pair. And then the father seeking, the unknown father seeking to know himself is what leads to the emanation of the lower aeons. And in the process of the emanation of the lower aeons, at some point, Sophia comes into whatever kind of being Sophia has, which it's not clear. She certainly doesn't have material existence. She has some kind of more transcendent existence. We don't really know what that is. And then Sophia, out of her nature, goes on to create the Demiurge. So what's implied in the question is that, well, of course, the Demiurge is bad. Is it? Yeah. Is the Demiurge bad? It causes you inconvenience, definitely. But is it bad? Is it malign? Is the iconic system malign? Is that actually implied in the text? Perhaps. Is it true? Search your own experience. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. Some later versions of the text refer to this as Sophia's error, but early versions of the text do not. They just say what she did. Is that a mistake? Search your experience. Um, so the key thing for me in this question, and the reason is it's a really terrific, profound misunderstanding question, <laughs> yeah. because it exposes literally everything that people take from mainstream Christianity when they try to become try to take on Gnosticism and we push, I did, I had done exactly these things, right? Like I've taken exactly these assumptions into that material and it took me literally years to actually read what was in front of my eyes and discover that what was there was different to what I expected. So nice work. No, yeah. please carry on. <laughs> and to, to just underline what I said, search your experience. <laughs> Yeah, and we're not saying that this is this is a bad question or, or these assumptions are, are not easy to make, right? We, we've all made them. And again, it is partly later interpretations of Gnosticism. It's partly sort of uh, uh, parodies of Gnosticism or misunderstandings of Gnosticism or uh, people who don't want you to like Gnosticism who, who are introducing and pushing some of these ideas, right? So that's why, you know, one of the reasons why we're saying a profound misunderstanding. So, you know, kind of to, to I'm agreeing completely with Tim and then sort of add to what he's saying, it's at, if you're going to take a more quote unquote scientific or atheistic bent, it's like shouting at the universe. Well, if there's going to be all these problems, why did you let the Big Bang happen? Right? It doesn't make any sense for me to shake shake my arm at the sky and be like, well, why why did you let the Big Bang happen? Um, um, the other thing is as well is it is a metaphor, and I think sometimes in Gnosticism, sometimes in religion in general, as modern people, when we, when we say it's a metaphor and it's a myth, and we'll talk about that in a moment, it's it's a way to get out of supernaturalism, right? It's a way to say I'm a modern person, I don't believe in all of this junk. It's a metaphor and it's a myth. But that, that's not what I'm trying to do here, right? It's, it's because our, our little ant brains cannot understand the, these huge concepts. I mean, we can't understand the Big Bang, right? We can't understand scientific concepts. They, they cannot be well described in words. Math can describe some of them better. So we have to tell stories. We tell a story about something called the Big Bang. But that's, that, that's a story that comes through words, and words are fallible. So same thing with this story. But it helps us understand something about how and why the world started and uh, more importantly, about our own experiences. Now, I, I think it is important that, that it is a myth, and I think it is important that, that these beings have some kind of consciousness. Uh, I, I think it is important that they're, that, that they're figures. 
uh, even if they're fictional figures, because I think that does say something profound. But, but I, I am going to back up what Tim is saying, that 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 if, if this is somehow more literally true, if these are beings that are out there in another dimension, if they may be figures of consciousness, but it's a consciousness that we wouldn't be able to understand, right? And of course, it's also a metaphor because Sophia means wisdom, right? This is the story of how wisdom comes into the world. So, and something could be both a metaphor and literally true, right? That, that's what uh, C.S. Lewis said about Christianity. It's it's a true myth. Uh, Jason, do you, do you have any thoughts uh, thoughts on these uh, these these nested questions? Yeah, I think uh, um, I, I like to uh, where a lot of where Tim went there, like the idea of benevolent not being like being an implied element of the question, um, uh, because that does it. You are sort of importing. You know, like, okay, if the demiurge isn't good, then therefore the thing that would be on that must be good or must be better or in some way, like uh, in some sort of value judgment. And I think that's the, that does betray, I think, a more, um, uh, like a hope for a simpler answer, like, or a hope for a fundamental simple answer um, that that sadly isn't there. <laughs> Unfortunately, you like, it's this element of having to go and do the work and have the experience and understand that, yeah, like that, uh, that yeah benevolence isn't necessarily the plan now it's not also the opposite of benevolence it's not like it's not a, a demiurge a, like demiurge to the demiurging um the, that goes even further <laughs> and pushes it into a you know like the world is really cruel no no demiurge it's just, for marsupials. yes go on <laughs> it's, it's that the it's that like this is the world that that we're in and that there is something that is beyond and and below and throughout that that is like that I, like as jonathan was saying we can't conceive of and so um so trying to apply something to it uh in a logical fashion is always going to be is going to add to error is going to add to a problem um like this was i remember actually listening to a talknosis episode where where uh, someone was talking about the like the various christological debates about like how like christ can't be physical because no God would do this to Jesus and therefore that, etc. And I was like, guys, you can't do algebra with religion. Like you can't, you cannot solve for Christ, you know, like um, uh, the, you can, uh, and as anyone who's probably heard me on the show before, listen to my conclave talks knows, I prefer to look at it from an aesthetic perspective. Like what, what seems resonant, what seems effective. And I think like what's resonant about, uh, the the God beyond the demiurge is that there is a uh, a ground of being that's a that that feels like a resonant piece of it. D benevolence doesn't have to be a part of that. Benevolence doesn't have to be a part of that resonance. Um, in fact, benevolence is like maybe something that we get to experience here that gives us enough calm and peace to be able to experience what a ground of being might feel like. Yeah. So uh -huh. like. Benevolence is what we want to practice here. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, in my reading of Secret John, it, it is a negative portrayal of, of the Demiurge and the Archons, but they're not necessarily evil, right? Even Secret John, even the, you know, the more hardcore Cephians seem, or Cephian texts, uh, portray the Demiurge <laughs> as, as an ignorant oaf, right? He's, he's selfish, he's, but he's, he's kind of dumb. He, he's not cruel. You know, he's he's a big dum dum up there in the sky trying to figure things <laughs> out. He thinks he's God, but he's not. So he he installs a very poor system that ends up hurting people, right? And there might be this it might be in in some way be literally true, but again, I think where the metaphor, I do not have to <laughs> stretch it out. We have more demiurge questions. I, I'm sure we will dive into those. Uh, so maybe we'll move on to the next question, which is, is Gnosticism relevant in the modern world? That's from Bergpug. I'll take that one. No. Okay, next question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there's better things to do with your time. Like, yes. uh, to, to, to probably misquote the Buddha, better not to start. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, all, all jokes aside, and this is a, a founder of the show's uh, line, uh, Father Tony, but he, he says that, you know, uh, as an active priest, people come to him being like, you know, should I be a Gnostic priest? Should I be a Gnostic? And Tony takes them out for, for drinks and, and, and tries to dissuade them from it because, you know, maybe you want to try another religion. Uh, I'm over exaggerating what he said in the past, but it's, 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 it's tough, right? It's, it's not, it's not an easy 
it's, it's not an easy belief system. It's not an easy religion for a lot of reasons. And, and it's not just because of, of some of the complexity or because we're so smart and so great we can take it, right? It's also a, a religion that is that is very influential on art and philosophy, but is struggling to come back, right? Um, and I think it's going to get more and more important for, for communities and strong communities in the future. And I am hoping that that Gnosticism can be a strong community that will support people. But to, to be less facetious, yes, obviously, I, I do believe that it is relevant and in some ways more relevant. We, we live in extremely Gnostic, archonic times. And it's always going to be relevant because, you know, more and more I see how influential Gnosticism is on philosophy, on the thought of the West, on art. And I know if you listen and watch the show that I rant about this all the time, but through present research and some, some metanoia, I've really come to orientate myself to the belief that Gnosticism really is this powerful force in Western thought that is often suppressed and repressed. It has to be dealt with. If you're going to deal with philosophy or religion in the West, you should be wrestling with Gnosticism. And you can wrestle with it and say, this isn't for me, or this is a heresy, or I'm going to be a trad calf. But it, it has to be addressed. So it's, it's definitely relevant. Um, but, you know, if I, could, if I could snap my fingers and make everybody in the world a, um, a high church Gnostic, you know, I, I probably wouldn't. Because it's, it is one path among many, and we need lots of different perspectives. Now, if I could snap my finger and have everybody be kind and benevolent community members who have an appreciation for the sacred, uh, I most certainly would, right? Uh, and if I could snap my fingers and make modern Nazi movements bigger, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely do that. I'd definitely do that. Um, yeah, more thoughts from, from you two on this on this question? Um, I think uh, <laughs> I think um, uh, I, I just gave a talk in Conclave about like trying to be Gnostic when uh, somebody cuts you off in traffic. Um, and I think that to me is like, uh, that's often been where, how I try to find a way to make my experience of Gnosticism useful in my day to day. Um, I think it's, it's relevant, I think, as, as uh, John said, because we do have, uh, we do live in, in times that feel particularly uh, in, in which the, like, in which forces of limitation are being pushed upon us, um, uh, in which our ability to to have enough peace and calm to be benevolent is uh, feels like it's harder and harder, and there's the systems that we're in are leave less and less space for that. So I think that's that's a I think a, a real use that that Gnosticism can have, and that and that approaches particularly the AJC, which I think really encourages the work of finding the space and finding the the calm to 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 experience that benevolence. That's that's, I think, its relevance and its importance. I think the the flip side of it too is that all of this limitation can mean that the the risk is that someone can just tell you, oh, it's demiurges and archons, so like now you don't have to worry about it. Now you can just hate a new enemy um, and not do any work. That's that's I think the danger, the 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 the, the dark side of Gnosticism, I suppose. You know, it's funny you mentioned that too, Jason, because I, I have been thinking a lot about sort of a, a concept of good Gnosticism and bad Gnosticism. I, I need a better better terms for it. But but it kind of goes back to, to Harold Bloom and to others who see this incredible influence that Gnosticism has. But Gnostic ideas can be misinterpreted. They can be misapplied. So just because it's influential and hiding out there in, in Western thought doesn't mean that some of its ideas that are sort of yanked out of the wider context, mistranslated and misapplied, uh, can't be bad and negative. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I am. And, and Harold Bloom was a great lover of Gnosticism. Uh, so, he, you know, he kind of uh, saw himself as a true Gnostic. And then he saw he, he saw the, the religion of America as, as this sort of bastardized Gnosticism. And, and mm -hmm. I know there's there's some other thinkers uh, along those lines as well. And it's something that I, I kind of want to develop. So if there's any patrons out there that want to. Uh, uh, I mean, not on the Patreon, although you can do it there. If anybody wants to uh, pay me to become a philosopher so I can sit around and think about good <laughs> and bad Gnosticism for eight hours a day, you know, you got my email. Um, okay, moving moving on. Uh, do you... Do can I, you, can I oh, sorry, grab please. the is Gnosticism relevant thing just yep. for a second? Um, I, just, I mean, you guys have spoken really eloquently about the the cultural impact of Gnosticism, and and I think John, I really resonate with, um, I resonate with both of you on that. And John, I really resonate with the the suppressed tendency in Western culture thing. I mean, there's a 
there's a real cycle of kind of like the dualistic heresy kind of like you know it's almost like a a cycle where it comes up and is suppressed and comes up and is suppressed over and over and over and over through through sort of european history um european mediterranean history i suppose um and that's definitely true the uh, i want to just go at it from a from a spiritual tradition question is gnosticism relevant to the modern world um uh it's a it's te it's terrible like don't <laughs> like, it's a really awful idea um for several reasons i mean one is that it's um it's really unclear right there's a vast amount written both in the early period and presently um and it's all just baffling and makes no sense it takes years to fathom what any of it's talking about so it's really difficult um and misleadingly difficult in some cases uh <laughs> and that leads to a really key problem which is that the fundamental the fundamental most transformative idea in the whole of the tradition is gnosis the direct experiential knowing of the divine um but we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to understand epistemic knowledge um, in this whole movement. Everyone is banging on constantly about what the texts mean and how to interpret them and what it implies for politics and all this stuff, which is completely irrelevant to the spiritual journey. It's not, I mean, I'm being polemic, but <laughs> almost completely irrelevant to the spiritual journey. It's got, in terms of the thing that's being pointed to that you're getting asked to do, like everyone's staring at the finger, not the moon. Mm. Like, and that's, a very profound misunderstanding of the tradition, um, <laughs> which most of us are doing most of the time. Like I'm not saying other churches are doing it and the AJC is not, it's all through the AJC, it's all through me. There's there's like a, a tremendous amount of the stuff I wind up putting on Joanite School or, or teaching in a conclave or, or doing is just picking apart various bits and pieces of all this material. Not the point, not the point, got nothing to do with anything. What's got anything to do with anything is gnosis, is, is actually acquiring the direct experiential knowledge of the divine. And the only way to do that is through spiritual practice. And that's where you come to the second problem. The tradition is utterly barren of um, suggestions for spiritual practice. <laughs> like uh, completely barren. Everything we have, we've stolen from someone else. The, the bulk of useful stuff comes from mystical Christianity, either in the West or the hesychastic tradition in the East or it's taken from Western mystery tradition, esotericism, tarot, path working, all that stuff, or people just go find their spiritual practice in something else like Martinism. You know, it's not here because there's nothing there, right? Like it's all... Um, the The only thing I want to, I want to, to, to poke back at there is that I think the, uh, I think that Gnosis can and does happen in all kinds of places, even and especially outside of specifically religious traditions. Oh, 100%. Right percent but that doesn't betray the basic i mean that doesn't deny the basic point which oh is, no no it's no irrelevant. it's irrelevant <laughs> <laughs> so if you actually wanted a spiritual tradition that actually did something productive for you you should pick one that's actually productive like i think like zen is probably really good you should go do that um or um <laughs> like what else works uh i mean honestly not many things um uh <laughs> Chin Buddhism, uh, it's pretty good. I think um, there's some good stuff in the Sufi traditions. You should avoid most Western stuff. You should avoid anything. Anything uh, I could go on, but get out of Gnosticism. Like it's the worst. It's like the nadir of useful spiritual traditions. It's it's I think, terrible. I, I so mean, I, I think what you're doing. The only reason Gnosticism could possibly be relevant in the modern world to an to a specific individual is if you don't find yourself with another choice. That's the only reason I'm here. Is that mm -hmm. I don't appear to have another choice. Nothing else seems to quite pluck the various strings that I need plucked in order to 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 have the experiences that I've needed to have. And so, I, you know, which is why you know we look at our, every every Gnostic church looks at our communities and goes, "Wouldn't it be great if we had more people?" You're not going to get them. You're not going to get them because only a very small set of people are broken in the right particular ways to find this helpful. <laughs> Oh no! It's, I I I see a lot of truth in what you're saying, and you know, and sometimes the problem with the show is that we're all very nice people and we agree with each other too much, right? But I, I do really agree with this is the only thing that that's going to work for me, and I've tried other things, right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I've been a spiritual seeker, I've been involved with other communities, and for this this is it, and maybe maybe it, I'm I'm broken in the right or way or broken in the wrong way, right? But of course, the cracks that's how the light gets in. Oh, so, uh, you know, such a such a Quebecois. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Um, you know, there's, 
that, that, that reminds me of something that I think Deacon is. It, is he Deacon Father Rasbach? Um, uh, the bishop. Bishop Bishop Rasbach. Bishop. I'm so sorry, Rasbach. Please don't curse yeah. me. Um, but the uh, the where I was going to go there is that I, in one of his conclave talks, he said something about. Um, I think he was actually talking more about like um, uh, esoteric, deeper esoteric practices, but it, it stuck with me as he said something to the effect of um, that a lot of these works are so profoundly weird and um, complicated that it kind of breaks your brain open. And then, then you like, as you say, then the light can get in, but it, but for a certain subset, that's what we require. It's like, it's like people who like modernist literature, you know, like James Joyce isn't fun to read, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but for a certain, but for a very small amount, there is the there is that thrill of like the puzzle solving and et cetera and et cetera, and then maybe some connection happens and you're just like, oh, oh, okay, you know. That's, that's um, really well. I I I'm with you. I think I think my particular brain needed to be defeated. <laughs> right. If the if the ego yeah. is going to be brought to its knees, it needs to be defeated. And for some of us, this is the complexity that we needed to be defeated. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, I had another thought there, but it was, oh yeah, no, I, I think just the only other thing I, I, re I really love everything Bishop Tim was saying. I think, uh, uh, I think we need to do an, a, a whole show about how you get Gnosticism. Yeah. yeah let's do it. <laughs> and it'll be an hour of dead air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, make a, you make a really good point and it connects to what John was saying before, I think that, um, you know, the stuff in. The stuff in this material, I mean, the Trinity functions like this in, in mainstream Christianity. It's just that most people tactically misunderstand that, so they think they get it and they don't. The point of this stuff is to the point of this stuff is to defeat rational analysis and conceptualization because rational analysis and conceptualization is the problem. Yep. Yep. The Trinity well, and, that it was and, basically to, to break your brain, and then everybody started uh, applying Greek Greek uh, uh, logic to it, and as Jason was saying, doing math. You know, we have thousands yeah. of years, thousands of pages of some of the smartest people in the world doing math with the Trinity. So if the cube root of Christ equals the square of the Holy Spirit, then we divide it by grace and add yeah. really yeah. the monad. Then yeah. well, I think and, it equals salvation. And this is the thing. This is actually kind of why I, I push so much for talking about religion in the language of aesthetics. Is that like you, you completely remove like... You, like people come to poetry asking for their minds to be broken open, asking right. for the paradox and understanding that the paradox is the point. And it's like, if we kind of said like, we're going to teach, we're going to teach you this epic poem of Gnosticism versus this tractate of truth, you know, mm -hmm. then I think might, people might be like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to relax into this. I'm just going to let my brain go loose. I'm just going to, yeah. I'm going to let this happen. Which is why a lot of the, I mean, it's, it's why, it's why every, every Gnostic out, you know, I think we all have our little list of like, you know, 20 favorite Gnostic films and we swap the titles from time to time because I, <laughs> you know, apprehending stuff. I mean, it's the thing about good, good cinema is that appreh apprehending this stuff aesthetically kind of, it's a more effective way of doing it, I think, in yeah. some way. Yeah. And uh, something I do like about Gnosticism, which I, which I think is following up with, with what both of you are saying, particularly what you were saying, Jason, about paradox, right? Is that it's not that the truth is complicated it's that truth is contradictory and humans do not do well of contradiction and i find that gnosticism as a religion as a revived religion the gnostic text is, is something that really pushes contradiction and highlights it and makes you grapple with it it makes your little brain that doesn't want to deal with contradiction deal with it it's it's part of our basic human nature that we want things to be one thing and then we repress and suppress that things can be the opposite of itself right so the contradiction and the fact that contradiction is woven into reality or consciousness can only perceive reality uh, through contradiction if it's not woven into reality is is something that gnosticism does very well not the only thing that does it lots of other i shouldn't say lots but but there are other systems other spiritual systems and philosophies that do it but but i find gnosticism kind of rubs your face in contradiction uh and you know uh that breaks break some of those those repressing hopefully break some of those, those repressing patterns mm -hmm. um okay moving on do okay. you view Gnosticism as inherently monotheistic? That's from Chandler Bauer. I'll start with that one, which is which is yes and no, because Chandler, there's no such thing as monotheism. 
right? People keep trying to do it. But, you know, you have Islam, you have Judaism, uh, you have particular forms of Islam. They're like, well, there's, there's only one God. There's just one God. Uh, but the Quran also says that there's angels, right? And okay, what's an angel? Well, it's a servant of God, but it's a supernatural being of unlimited power that can create and destroy, and it's a god, right? Uh, th there's no monotheistic religions. People keep trying to create them, and there will be a monotheistic religion for a little while, and then somebody will come along and, you know, introduce a god, uh, a demi, a demigod, a son of a god, a saint, a hero, uh, an ancestor who is elevated. Sometimes we miss this because of of our cultural bigotries. So if we were, you know, if you describe, if you say, you know, Catholicism or Christianity is, is a monotheistic religion, um, eh, but then you start describing it to somebody who's never seen it before and you start talking about the Trinity and the sun and the saints and the angels, well, they're going to say, well, those are gods, right? Uh, but if we were looking at some tribe in the, in the, you know, Amazon that was like, oh, well, there's, there's one, there's one big God, but then there's, he has all these like under gods, but we don't really think of them as gods or messengers. We'd be like, well, okay, I'm an anthropologist, you know, really those, um, th th those go into the God category. Uh, now, yes and no. I'm probably going to say yes and no a lot. Uh, depending on how you define monotheism, you, there's been a long standing tradition of interpreting monotheism, you know, as a form of non-duality, right? So here all Israel, your God is one. Uh, same thing in Islam, God is one. Uh, that's interpreted by many to say that there's only God, there's only one God. And that's not what it's saying. It says God is one, right? We're not flipping it around. So it's the monad again. Uh, go, Bishop Tim. <laughs> um, I think uh, Bishop Tim's giving me the, the chance to say a quick thing before I go. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Jason. Hit it. Yeah, uh, I've, I've got to head out here in a second, but I think um, uh, the, maybe the quick thing, and, and uh, Tim will probably uh, run with the ball on this uh, after I go, is that, um, is it monotheistic? It's like, well, like, how do you define God? <laughs> you know, um, it kind of goes back to that whole thing about the ground of being and the, like, you know, the misunderstanding of what benevolence might be. Is that, like, uh, is it monotheistic? It's like, well, that's, like, that depends on where you're willing to draw the line around religion. Um, uh and philosophy and consciousness and all kinds of things. So that's, yeah, to, to me, asking if it's monotheistic is again, uh, expecting that it's gonna fit in a box that, in, in a different part of the bookstore than it's actually shelved in. Yeah, so, oh, I was gonna say, uh, uh, Jason, Jason has to go. Um, so we have a, a question about politics that we're going to save for next time. And this is good because it gives me time to set up his Gnostic Wisdom email so you can email him all of your <laughs> angry emails. <laughs> Just like whenever politics barely comes up on the show. The one thing I'll say about politics, and you know, spoiler alert for when we do get to this question, is there are countries outside of America. Did, did you know this? I, you know, wait, don't we all live wait. in them? <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> so, so keep that Tim, in mind this, when we do this answers, this, answers, this answers so many of your questions about where you live, right, Tim? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got to go, but it's been a super pleasure, and I'm sorry I couldn't stay longer with these guys. Bye, everybody. Bye, Jason. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Tim, you good for another twenty minutes, half hour? For sure, as long as okay. you uh, yeah. You can have me for another an hour and ten. Yes, well, the, the thing is, we could easily go for an hour and ten, as people know from our uh, Secret John uh, free part series. Uh, we could probably go an hour and ten on, on any one of these questions. Okay, next we have a I, question. Can, I stick oh. with, can, can we stick with the monotheism one for a second? Just oh, for please. Couple... Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. Sorry. I didn't get your answer on that. Yeah. Um, because this, this question provides a very profound misunderstanding of the material. <laughs> <laughs> uh... <laughs> Um, no, no, it's not essentially monotheistic. In fact, it's an extended meditation on the insanity of monotheism. Um, monotheism, by most people's account, really arises to clear flourishing for the first time in Hebrew religion, um, you know, somewhat before the Babylonian captivity, uh, and then and really only after that starts to arrive in other places. Even when it arrives in Hebrew religion, it arrives as henotheism, so the elevation of a single god above other gods. It becomes monotheistic only with the reforms of King Josiah, well spotted, um, <laughs> immediately prior to the Babylonian invasion and the, and the captivity, right? And it arises as a political 
desire because monotheism is intrinsically a political matter. One because God, it, one king. One God, one king. Because prior to that, different cities had their own city gods, different nations had their own national gods. When people came into alliances, that creates polytheism. Um, well, it doesn't create polytheism. Polytheism arises naturally from just ordinary people encountering the natural world, right? And having ancestors that they want to venerate and all that, all those ways in which, you know, religiosity emerges naturally in human beings. Um, so for monotheism to occur, everything the other God needs to get suppressed and denied. And that can only happen politically. That's not a natural thing that people decide. Right? So the one time it happens is with, well, one time it happens is with Akhenaten in Egypt, actually, prior to all this, to install the reign of, of Aten as the, as the only real god in the Egyptian pantheon doesn't go well. <laughs> I think it's fair to say, uh, you know, it went so badly that Akhenaten's successors erased his image um, and he was forgotten until recently. Nobody knew Akhenaten even existed until the late 1800s or something of the 20th century. Um, not so well. Went better with Josiah, right, who, um, you know, promotes these you know, it's presented in the Bible as the reforms to Judaism, but a close read, um, not Judaism, Hebrew religion, I beg your pardon. Um, a close read of uh, the biblical material kind of, you know, tells the story. There, there was lots of God worship happening all over, uh, all over Israel and Palestine, and, and that gets centralized into a single cult centered around a single temple, coincidentally, right next to the royal palace in Jerusalem, where a single God is worshipped, and, and the worship of that God is controlled by the royal priesthood, right? So... Ta-da, everything else is banned, right? So the only way everything else persists is outside of the political control of that king. Um, that gets, you know, that's what turns into, you know, the later Hebrew religious movements of, of Judaism and eventually Christianity, right? And to some extent, eventually Islam, which, you know, without going too much into that, I mean, the, the beginnings of Islam are, and you know, the, I, you know, I like to say, um, Muhammad founded a nation, uh, the Buddha uh, founded a monastic uh, bureaucracy and, and Jesus struggled to get 12 guys together in a room. Um, you know, in terms of organizational skill, uh, you know, Muhammad takes the cake, really, uh, did really a good job. But, it, you know, like the politics in Islam and spirituality in Islam are intrinsically intertwined because Islam, the story of the beginning of Islam is the bringing together of a whole bunch of peoples and the, and the you know, teaching them one way or another to focus on a single deity. Um, monotheism is always a, a political move. So that's not what Gnosticism is. Gnosticism is about kind of exposing the fraud of monotheism in a lot of ways. Also recalling um, the earlier understanding, you know, what, what those writers and teachers, uh, I think, held as an earlier and more authentic understanding of the nature of the divine. And fundamentally, it overcomes come at what you were talking about before to some extent that that all you know, this henotheistic thing right like which is the you know you take all the gods you say one of them is the big one you push everybody else down and say they're just angels or they're just demons or they're just something or other you know um and you and you elevate the one god so what the gnostic material does is it distinguishes the monad in kind from all the other divine activity and then it you know, it, it establishes layers in orders of, you know, dis distinguishing layers of being amongst these various spiritual non-corporeal entities. But the monad is distinguished as not a god. Like the secret book of John, in fact, says it at length. Yeah. It, it, it <laughs> right, right up says that, that statement. Is not a god. Not a god. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about, right? Yeah. So therefore not monotheistic. Yeah. Um, but something like uh non-duality in the sense that advaita means it non-duality means a lot of things to a lot of people but non-duality in the sense that advaita means it um so it's not mon it's even it's even challenging to call it monistic i think because of the amount of work that the early material um particularly secret john the thunder perfect mind put into using self-contradiction as a way to kind of undo the singularity uh, of the monad um oh, sorry i'm banging on this is getting too exotic but anyway Yes, no, no, this, this is great. This is this is what this show is for. And I think this your reading is is correct. And I think it's also very obvious if you think about it for a moment. Because what does the demiurge say? That there is no other god but me. There is no other god. One god. Yeah, and that is that is obviously a parody, right? This is this is the writer. It's it's pretty obvious when you're reading Secret. I shouldn't say it's pretty obvious, but it's if you read it more than once, it's pretty obvious that on the, that on the sixth reading, it becomes obvious. Yeah. But... yeah. 
Uh, but you know, there's a lot of parody and satire in the text, right? Uh, would, it, yeah. You know, you're, you're presented with these two parallel realities, right? Yeah. The monad, the unknown father, and Barbello, the the harmonious unfolding of the divine realms, you know, and the ways that, and the various kinds of um, multiple interplays between them. You know, there's there's pentads and quaternaries, and you know, all sorts of numerical systems and you know, they almost, I'm doing this because it almost feels like they're dancing with each other in that, in that sort of upper realm. And then that's parodied in the lower realm by the Demiurge who insists that he is the only one and then creates, you know, obedient ranks of, of obedient servants who also disobey because you can't do anything right, you know. So it's kind of like, there you go. That's what you're getting told the system is. This is what the system actually is. Which, which thing would you prefer to hold as the divine realm? Your call. I mean, you know, you do you. And, uh, and of course, there, there is a level right below that one as well, perhaps with a similar structure, which I think ah. feeds in quite well to, to our next question, which comes from a, a friend of a show, uh, uh, Lux01. Uh, Lux is a moderator at the excellent uh, Reddit slash r slash Gnostic subreddit, as well as the Discord that is associated with that subreddit does lots of great work for modern Gnosticism. Now, I, I'm a bit of uh, inside baseball. I, I know that, that Lux has posted that they get uh, frustrated when people are asking questions on the Discord and on the Reddit, they're always asking about the Demiurge. They're obsessed with the Demiurge. It's Gnosticism all about the Demiurge. So perhaps Lux is asking this, hopefully Lux is asking this so, so that the, in the future when someone asks a question, they can just post a link to the show. So here is Lux's question. Do you think the concept of the Demiurge is the most important aspect of Gnosticism? And what are some of the different ways in which this concept can be seen? No, uh, no, no. <laughs> In fact, the question betrays a very profound misunderstanding of the matter. <laughs> I, well, I think in this case, perhaps deliberately so. So, yeah. not, not, not from. I mean, we'll we'll treat this as like a, a transparent handing on of a question from Lux. But do you want to go? Or, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Yeah, I, I would say no, and 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 because it is such a great hook. I think it does really capture people's imagination, perhaps particularly now in a in this weird post secular world. I, I think this idea of, of a doofus god really uh, really grabs people, and, and it is. It's a great hook, right? That's why one of the reasons why you keep seeing demiurgic figures in fiction. It's this great storytelling engine. Is it the most important aspect? No. Uh, does it say something really important about reality, about divinity and our relationship to it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's still an important concept. And I, I think for something to be Gnosticism as opposed to Gnostic key or mystical, if you don't have the demiurge, you need something that's demiurgic. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be this, this figure, right? Who's a character, who is a fictional character in a story. Uh, you know, Secret John is a fictional story that somebody wrote down based on other stories modeled after Greek myth and Greek tragedy, actually, a Greek tragic play. The, you know, you need to have some sort of concept similar to it. And I think you need this, this break, you know, between this world and the divine world. And that's where you get into stuff that's Gnostic y. Can you have forms of Gnosticism without the Demiurge, without this specific character? I, I would say yes. Uh, uh, Tim, what do you, uh, do you want to elaborate? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the hook is in the most important aspect of Gnosticism. The yeah. Demiurge is unquestionably a an important aspect of Gnosticism, but the, the figure of the Demiurge exists within uh, a narrative system, right? And so it plays a particular role within the narrative system of Gnostic myth. Um, and that's an important role in that narrative system, but f exclusive focus on the Demiurge, which I, I feel like is pain. This is a lot of what you get with people that are new to it, um, is like exclusive focus on the Demiurge to the exclusion of everything else, right? But really, like they take all that time to tell the story <laughs> because every part of that story is a crucial part of that story. I mean, there's, you know, there's some things you could probably leave out, but there's not a lot, right? Like it's pretty thin. The reason Secret John, and we, you know, we're, we're Sethian nerds, right? So we're focusing exclusively on that text and there's a lot of other texts, but Secret John, Gospel of the Egyptians, uh, Reality of the Rulers, you know, they, they all follow a similar structure. And the, the, the reason they take the time to tell these detailed narratives, and the reason the narratives are quite hard to understand is because they're so minimal, right? Like there's not a lot of time taken to flesh anything out. There's no character development, right? We don't, we don't hear a lot about the landscape, you know, the, nobody's taking the hobbits to Isengard. Um, it's, uh, it, it's just as bare bones as could possibly be 
So that's ought to tell you that all the different constituent parts, the monad, the unknown father, Barbello, the, the particular aeons, Autogenes Christ, the luminaries, the realms of the luminaries, the unfolding, the Sophia, the action of Sophia, the, cre you know, the, cre the birth of the Demiurge, and then you know, what Sophia does about that you know, in the aftermath of that birth, and then what the Demiurge then goes on to do, and then the revelation of the, all those steps, right? There's all these steps, and they're all crucial steps, right? So if you're focused on the Demiurge, my advice would be to you just, just de-res a little bit and just go and read the rest of the story and kind of figure out why that character's there. And then try to think about, and this is the second part of Lex's question, what are the different ways that the figure of the Demiurge can be seen? That's the crucial thing, right? Um, which I can just roll on into if you want me to, but I can also- yeah, I, actually, can back. I tackle that one for a second and then yeah. you can roll on in? You know, I'll start with a, a little bit of history. So, so it's nerd out a bit, is the Roman emperor was a living God on earth, right? A God that you were required to worship as a Roman citizen. You had to at least offer the, some, some incense to the statue of the emperor. Right. Uh, there was good emperors, but particularly during the, the times that some of these texts were written and right before these times, uh, there were some very bad emperors. They were ignorant oafs. So, you know, Nero was probably before the time of this text, but he, he left such a big impression on all forms of Christianity. He's, he's always sort of lurking there in the background. So when, when Bishop Tim was talking about the, the Secret John presents, you know, two models, right? You have the... The world of, of the pleroma and then you have the parody world of the demiurge right which is the world right above ours in in ancient people's imaginations and as bishop tim was saying you have this 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 ruler who's an oaf who thinks that he's the only god who uh controls through control who creates a, a system of archons who have to serve him uh archon of course means ruler uh, I think people are are going are seeing where I'm going with this, right? So one step down from the Demiurge's world is also our world. He runs this world. He put the order that he has in the world above us into this world, right? So it's 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 a parody of political power. It's a parody specifically of the Roman emperor. Uh, archon just means ruler yet again. Like the local ruler who reported to the emperor would have been called an archon. It'd be the equivalent of calling someone a, a congressperson today, right? It's, that's that's what the the language of Gnostics would have used, or a member of parliament. <laughs> so, so there is a there is a political angle to this, and uh, outside of but it, but it's a, a politics that is. You know, beyond what we what we often call politics, but instead is is a meditation on power, how power works in this world, how power cuts us off from each other, how power cuts us off from ourselves, how power cuts us off from the divine. So this is one way that the demiurge can be seen. But I, I think it's just one. Uh, but I think it's an important one to highlight. And, and I think you know, there's been some recent politicians in the only country in the world that matters, the United States, that that I think really illustrate what the demiurge is like, which is, you know, vain, arrogance, a big dumb dumb, doesn't use power that well, doesn't really know what they're doing, thinks they're the best. And in case someone thinks I'm talking about a particular president, I, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll also say maybe senile, <laughs> doesn't know what's going on, isn't really awake, is making a big mess of things. So I think some, some recent developments have uh, allowed us to to really highlight this aspect of Gnosticism, but also to explain better who the Demiurge is. Because, because again, I think a lot of people think of him as a Satan or Milton's Lucifer, right? Uh, right. You know, the supremely powerful, cruel figure uh, who has created this world just to torture us uh, instead of, you know, the, a power-hungry moral. Powerful, crafty, and, and kind of, let's be honest, a little sexy. Yes. <laughs> not sexy. The Demiurge is not sexy. I just... No. Well, it depends I, what you're into. Do you like, you know, lion heads with uh, uh, with snake bodies? Yeah, I'm sure there's somebody with a furry fetish who will find that. Well, you know, actually, I think it's the paraphrase of uh, the paraphrase of Shem, uh, the, par the paraphrase of Seth, um, okay. that, that says that the, uh, the, the, the 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 says that the, calls the demiurge the womb. So mm. I, I I mean, if we're going to go visually with that, uh, yeah, so we, we won't go there. Okay, uh, <laughs> it's a rule of the show. We never discuss the paraphrase of Shem. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a good rule. I'm sorry to have broken it. 
<laughs> the first rule of Gnosis Club is we don't talk about Gnosis Club. The second rule is we don't talk about the paraphrase of Shem. If, um, uh, just to do a, I want to do a shout out to Sarah James if she if she watches this show. Uh, Sarah, we both know why we don't talk about the paraphrase of Shem. Um, I, I, uh, that was a that was an evening. Anyway, um, <laughs> can I can I just hop in on the on on the different ways it can be seen thing? Because I think I think that's gold. I think it's really I think that's really helpful what you're saying. I mean that a lot of the time when people talk about particularly this lower realm stuff, the demiurge and the archons, and a lot of the time people are kind of like saying, is it is it a real you know is this a reality that exists right or is it a psychological metaphor or is it a is it a political metaphor and and yes, I think yeah. is the best answer right because. If something, if what's being pointed to is a is an existent phenomenon, but perhaps not a, you know, it's not like a a, a cup or something, right? <laughs> it's an existent phenomenon or a spiritual tendency in the world, and that spiritual tendency is going to manifest itself in all different realms of 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 experience. So it's going to show up psychologically. It's going to show up politically. It's going to show up, you know, in all different realms of life. It's not, it's not like one or the other is the real one. They're all real, right? Like these are all, you know, different ways of experiencing reality. The two that, um, that are just in my head that I think are really important to point out. One is, um, I think the other thing that the Demiurge does is that the reason it's there in the text is to critique. It's, you know, I think the impetus for it is to critique a specific, um, that specific political monotheistic move in Hebrew religion. Yeah. Um, I think it's got that function, but whether or not the founders intended it, I think it also functions for us in the, in the modern day as a general critique of that general spiritual tendency, yeah. because what all human beings seem to love to do is to project. I should have done the last bit first, but still to project their own you know, fantasies of power and control on a divine figure and then to experience themselves being controlled by that divine figure. Like that happens in all religious movements, right? Like there's always a, there's always a kind of a tantric kind of freedom loving version of the religion. And there's the kind of like the iconic kind of control oriented version of the religion. And very often the founders teaching the freedom version and the, and, you know, it gets neatened up very quickly into something that you can, <laughs> that can control people very fast. I mean, you know, it's stark if you look at the depictions of God in, in the actual sayings of Jesus in the Gospels, right? Which is, a you know, this kind of weirdo kind of like brain breaking kind of tripped out kind of deity that just loves everyone in a very strange kind of psychedelic sort of a way. Like it's a really interesting divine figure that Jesus is portraying. Um, you know, fast forward not very long and suddenly everyone's reading Deuteronomy very closely and trying to make sure that they're, you know, following all the purity laws in order to not get consigned to hell, a concept which Jesus never speaks about. Um, so we've done it again, you know, like, and then we do it again and we do it again. And, you know, like the Protestant movements are often, you know, come from an urge to towards liberation and freedom from the Pope and then very quickly wind up just you know, pulling the Deuteronomic move yes, yet again, right? And and getting very obsessed with power and control. Sorry, I'm saying Deuteronomy and that you could misinterpret that as a critique of, yeah. you know, um, the the more holistic life enhancing embrace of the law as a way of, um, as a way of life that, you know, is more characteristic of modern Orthodox Judaism. And that's absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm talking about the way Deuteronomy gets misused by Gentiles, not by the way it's productively used by Jews, just to be super clear. Yeah. Um, because that sort of stuff is sometimes misheard. Uh, I'm never people actually. Love, people love accusing us of anti-Semitism. Into that, I say, email Jason at gnosticwisdom.net <laughs> with any of these any concerns about that issue. Well, to, to to just touch on that briefly, because we do stray into that territory so often. I mean, one of the reasons I keep saying Hebrew religion is to talk about the form of religious practice that was practiced in Israel, you know, 2,500 years ago or so, which is not the same thing as what becomes you know, what becomes diaspora Hebrew religion and then formalizes itself into the various strains of Judaism that then goes through, you know, 1800 years of development to become what, what Judaism is today, which is, you know, like a modern religious movement that's got all sorts of highways and byways and beautiful flowerings of its own and has its own, you know, deep integrity. And, and I would never want to be heard to be diminishing or disparaging that. I'm not disparaging any of this stuff. This is all just humans being humans, right? 
Uh, sorry, digression. The other big, I think, important interpretation of what the demiurge is, and I kind of alluded to it before, and, and that's it's an internal, the demiurge and the archons are internal realities. So there's a fundamental, um, this is a thing one could talk about for a great long time, but there's a, there's a fundamental issue in spiritual life, which is the, the interplay between our own psychodynamic tendencies that we bring with us from childhood um and our ability to actually it's, it's kind of jason was sort of pointing to this in a way that you know he was sort of talking about the the ways in which we practice benevolence in order to kind of you know relax the system enough to be able to acknowledge the divine reality and that's that's pointing to this same thing that to actually accept divine reality in the terms in which it's given to us we have to actually allow ourselves to entertain the possibility that we are loved that we're okay and that we're loved and that everything is okay and our system isn't built that way because we mostly come crashing out of childhood deeply convinced that you know life is a risk probably we're horrible everybody probably hates us or is about to and we've got to work really hard to prevent that happening all of which is the thing is part of the psychological machinery that's preventing us from actually noticing the the ways in which divinity is outpouring itself into ourselves at every moment and one of the key parts of that is this interior tendency to try to maintain psychological psychic control over our own internal functioning which we're all running with all the time which gets called the ego um it, or which just means i right it's the it's the the interior practice of continuously recreating a sense of like a psychological sense of self, right? Yeah. Um, that's what the, you know, the demiurge is constantly on the hustle <laughs> in the text. The ego is constantly on the hustle in the self. Um, and so one of the really important things about the demiurge, I think, is the ways in which to kind of look at the text and reflect on the ways in which that stuff is you know, I kind of resist the political interpretation because there's a tendency to kind of go, oh, yes, you know, all the bad stuff is happening out there. And it's like the call is coming from inside the house, as the old saying goes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so when you're looking at, you know, honestly, when you were desc describing, you know, um, potentially bad presidents in the United States, I thought, yeah, you could seriously be talking about, you know, at least seven of the last eight, probably, yep. with everything you just said, pretty much. Uh, um, all of them since JFK? The, the <laughs> it would be... Whichever one you'd leave out is a matter of personal yeah. opinion, I suppose, but most people would agree, seven of the last eight, I think. Um, yeah, the tendency is to kind of like, you know, pin the blame on, on people like that, you know, people in power that we can kind of say, well, they're the problem. But I, I guess I'd invite everyone, like when you, when you find yourself moved to criticize people in power, reflect on the ways in which those same tendencies are acting out in your own self. Like, yeah. what are the ways in which you're trying to maintain control over the aspects of yourself that you're not pleased with yeah. and that don't please you and that don't allow you to present the kind of self that you want other people to think you are versus the self that you actually are yeah. because you are angry and you are scared and you are incompetent and you are pathetic and you're also competent and capable and loved and that's the great puzzle of being a human being yeah no no yeah, exactly and, and, uh, it, from seeing it. And, and i think you're you're spot on and i i did want to clarify too when i was talking about you know political is the best word i could think of but really how power functions and sort of exterior and then gets interior um and, and when i was saying that it's, it's of course not the working right now like if you work in a corporation look at the corporation you work in it works just there as well yeah yeah it's 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 right. once you see it you see it everywhere and um and again you know we've said it a lot in the show when we talk about the demiurge uh, i said it before this, this i i think that these are not readings in the text right that that this is multi-leveled so you know what i'm saying and what tim say is are, is saying i i think are are both there in the text and intended by the original creators um and, and i think that the the community or the writer or the writers or philosophers who, who created secret john are were incredibly sophisticated and they have this psychological reading of of this this um 
I hate saying metaphor, you know, the psychological reading of the demiurge that, that you are unpacking, right? I don't think that this is a modern interpretation. I, I think what you're saying is, is there in the text uh, that they were very sophisticated people when it came to how the, the human brain works uh, and how we work as, as social creatures. Uh, and I think it is really important that if you are interested in Gnosticism, you want to be a modern Gnostic, that you do have to have some flexibility about the meaning of the Demiurge, that, that you have to wrestle uh, uh, and grapple with, with all these different interpretations, because, again, it's, it's multi-layered, it's fractal, and they're, they're all true. So uh, we're both uh, former theater nerds. It's about Jason is gone. He's a, uh, a present theater nerd, but it's Gnosticism is all about yes and true it's true it's true um and i won't talk too much uh again you know i'm assuming that 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 his uh his grace uh mar thomas uh closely watches uh each and every show uh probably with like, a bucket of ice chips so you know i'll very quickly i uh, mentioned lacan and his ilk uh but there's a concept uh uh in, in lacanian psychoanalysis and in the philosophy of people like shishak of the big other right the big other is this 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 figure uh that uh that we project these these fantasies of power and control and domination onto uh and the big other is everything from our dad to our boss to the system but uh lacan and some of the lacanians say that the big other doesn't exist or the big other doesn't know right it is it is a projection uh and i think that the demiurge is very much the big other um and when we realize that uh you know the demiurge both exists and doesn't exist, uh, we are, we're much more free. Mm -hmm. um, okay, moving on. Uh, we are uh, doing lots of, we will move away from Archons and Demiurgus soon, I swear. But but we have we have to get to this one, uh, uh, Bishop Tim, because it is from uh, a personal friend as well as friend of the show, as well as a very generous patron. So we have Mona, you know Mona, and she wants to know, are we just puppets with the only real choice in which Archon to follow? Uh, and is the point of Gnosticism to free yourself from the Archons? And if so, what then? Do you want to do you want to tackle that one? This is one of the few questions that doesn't portray a profound misunderstanding of the material. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or does it? Um, well, are we just puppets? The only real choices which I can to follow. I. Well, yes. And also, no, there's a, I, I have, I think, the good fortune to have watched all three of the first Matrix movies. Um, that's quite rare, I've realized. Most people watched the first one and then excitedly went to the cinema and watched the second one and then got very disappointed because it didn't give them the same feelings that the first one gave them. Um, and so they didn't go and see the third one. And the second and third ones were trying to take a standalone movie and turn it into the first part of a trilogy. And to do that, you've got to do the second part of the trilogy. And no one gets upset when they go and see the two towers that everything that happens is about people traveling from point A to point B in various ways, because part three all, ha all has to wind up in more Mordor. Um, uh, so, you know, like everyone just sits through all the Ents and the, and the, writers of Rowan and all that sort of stuff it's fine because you know you're going somewhere good but you people didn't know that with the second matrix movie so they checked out one of the things that one of the fundamental and most powerful things that happens and the reason number the second one part of the reason the second one is so dissatisfying apart from it being an extended chase movie um is that it kind of says right so up and what you haven't noticed though is that up until now all the things that neo's trusted are these other people who are also just programs in the system notably the oracle right but also you know he's trusted morpheus and he's trusted the oracle and he's trusted that all he's had faith that all these things are going to lead him into some kind of promised land what if that's all just part of the system what sort of what if that's all part of the system of control which is ultimately what's revealed in part three yeah. spoilers sorry but i presume everybody's read a summary of the matrix by now um so yes right like in so far as our disposition our our religious or our spiritual disposition is to orient ourselves towards some symbolic depiction of divinity and to follow that symbolic depiction, right? Mm -hmm. Our disposition is to do that, then what we are literally doing is choosing which archon to follow. Um, 
And so then you are following another icon, you know, and then perhaps, well, so then there's a path there potentially where if you keep going more deeply, you discover that you're following another icon. Um, you know, I'm not saying switching from God to God necessarily and picking another statue to put on the altar, you know, sometimes you go deeper than the depictions of perhaps Jesus that you grew up with as a Catholic and you go more deeply to a sense of the Christ energy or something. You read Rudolf Steiner and you, you get into the cosmic Christ and you kind of go, okay, what I'm really about is the cosmic Christ. Um, and so you're not actually, you know, you, you believe you're no longer following an archon, but you're still following an archon. There's still a, it's still a symbolic depiction of divine reality that you're, you're trying to track down. You're trying to offer worship to and devotion towards, right? Um, so perhaps then there's a path that where one goes deep enough into that, that that's revealed as an idol as well. And so that has to crack and reveal a deeper reality, which then leads you out into something beyond that. And then perhaps beyond that reveals itself as a, as another idol that you're now worshiping and that cracks and reveals a deeper reality. And perhaps somewhere in there, what you start to notice is, huh, I seem to be in this pattern of falling into these patterns of following and worship, right? Um, which we all do. Like we've all got these, these are psychological patterns that we have in ourselves that leads us towards certain dispositions in religious life. So there's several things that can go on there. Um, like one is to just kind of like, that's just how I do what I do. <laughs> and that's just fine. If it's working, I, I don't care. You know, if you're happy, have a ball, I don't mind. Um, if you really want to dig into the fundamental functioning of the self and, and kind of realize the game that your ego is up to at the deepest level, then you've got to be questioning, I think, all that. You know, you've got to question the you know, is this an archon that I'm devoted myself to? Is this an idol of some form that I'm now pretending is real? Have I taken a construct of my own, attached objective reality to it, you know, projected it and attached objective reality to it? And am I now treating that as, have I projected this sort of, you know, um, ob obscure object of desire onto it that I'm now trying to crave after. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff to question in there. Like, what have I done? What's that actually? What am I doing? Where's this urge coming from in myself? You know, that's all good stuff. Um, the last part of the question, uh, the point of Gnosticism is to free yourself from the icons, but then what? Yes, exactly. That's an excellent question. Yes, keep asking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep asking, because I, I think the impulse toward freedom is the correct impulse. Like the, the impulse away from oppression is sometimes problematic, but the impulse toward freedom is always a useful impulse, I think. Um, I've said all that and then it's vexing because there's a, there's a real role that devotion plays in undercutting certain tendencies in egoic functioning. So I don't want to try to say that devotion and worship are bad in some way because they're not and they can play a really useful role but if it's your predominant tendency and it's the primary thing you're doing all the time i guess i'd encourage you to kind of focus on that and question a little bit so Mona, i don't know whether you're asking that stuff um those questions kind of on your own behalf in terms of what's going on for you or whether you're kind of like seeing something and you're asking kind of about stuff that you're seeing in the world um but anyway yeah that's my thoughts yeah. i uh you, you know bishop tim kind of kind of I, I mean, you know, that's just why we like having him on the show and why I like having great conversations with him, because I was going to mention the third Matrix movie, which I think has one of the best endings of uh, uh, any movie, maybe the best ending of a movie in the 21st century. Uh, and, you know, that movie ends with Neo. OK, so, so you think that the Matrix is about a war, right? That the war of the imprisoned human against the Arcana computers. And the movie ends with with a truce, right? Through, uh, through Neo's sacrifice. Uh, anybody who can liberate themselves from the Matrix will stay liberated. Uh, anybody who stays in the Matrix will stay, right? There's, uh, the system will continue, but now there, there is a truce. And, and I think- And a know, genuine choice. Sorry? And a genuine choice. And a genuine choice, yes. So, you know, I, I, I think they, they were very insightful, the Wachowskis, in, in uh, uh, seeing this within Gnosticism, because uh, as as Bishop Tim has been talking about with some of these these answers and what we talked about on the show before, is is the, the way of the demiurge is is of control and fighting, right? 
So if you can get out of control and fighting, you are somehow getting out of the Archonic system. So when we think about fighting the Archons, trying to take back control, we are going to keep playing their games. And uh, something that, that a Gnostic priest who, who's now retired said to me a long time ago, I, I think someone, you know, he had been very frustrated with these constant questions about the Demiurge and, and Archons, is, you know, we, we live in this world and that means making peace with the Archons on some level, right? Having some kind of truce, uh, making friends with your demons uh, on some level. So that's that's what I'll, that, that's all I'll say about, about that. Um, yeah. Uh, watch Watch The Matrix Three. It's a great movie. It's got a great ending. Yeah, watch. I, I really, you know, a, I've done. I've done a. I've done a session a couple of times where I've, with people, we've kind of watched all three movies, kind of, you know, not all in one day, but you know, over over a closely spaced series of weeks, and you know, add some little exegetical notes. You know, try paying attention to this. Notice, notice all the numbers. Every time there's a number, pay attention to the number. Every time something's colored in a particular way, like consider that green means something. Yep. And, and ochres and reds mean something and, and gold means something specific. And what does that mean? What is being said because that colors appeared on the screen, right? All the names mean something. People have got weird names and they've got weird names for reasons. What's being said by those names? What's actually happening there? Um, Agent Smith. What does Agent Smith mean? What is he really about? Yeah, it's fun. And it's worth watching all three movies kind of in, in close succession, you know, like one week after another or something, give yourself enough time to chew on them or, you know, do the do the first one one weekend and do the last, you know, the second two the other weekend. Um, yeah. Honestly, you know, I, just, I didn't hate... It's a great the, series. Sometimes I wish I had made a fourth, you know? <laughs> too bad. I, I didn't hate the fourth. I didn't hate the fourth. I, I, I didn't hate it either. It, it's such a trifle. It was like it's it's like a McDonald's hamburger. Like I forgot that I watched it. <laughs> it's just it's just but it's it's absolutely a fine way to pass an hour and a half or however long it is. So sure. uh is it as profound or put together as, as the other three? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Think so. Yeah. Okay, so we are uh, somehow already at uh, the, an hour and, and 11. So, you know, easy for us. Uh, we, we got through more than two questions, which I think is pretty impressive. We got through one, two, three, four, five questions. Uh, Bishop Tim, let's do one more. Let's find one that, that's not about Archons or uh, Demiurges, even though those may come up. Okay, here we go. Here's one that I like. It seems like Gnostic ideas attract a fair number of conspiracy-minded people. Is mm. that true? And if it is, is it a problem? And that's also from uh, Burp Pug. Uh, Bishop Tim, do you, do you want to start with that one? Uh, look, I mean, uh, it. I mean, I share your experience, um, Burp Pug. I, I that which I suspect is that I seem to keep running into conspiracy-minded people when I'm around. The Gnostic movement, particularly online, right? Like particularly if you're on subreddits and places like that, you, you run into a lot of folks like that. Um, even in local communities, you run into a fair number of people like that. Um, and that's, yeah, uh, depending on your tendencies, that can either be, you know, fascinating or kind of terrifying, I guess, kind of depending. Um, so I think there's a truth to it. Uh, having said that, uh, there are so many conspiracy minded people in the current era that um, it's possible everyone's wondering where they're all coming from. <laughs> because, you know, you can show up to uh, fairly mainstream things and, and discover that there's like five people who really want to talk about reptilian overlords and whether the Queen of England is a cyborg. Um, I made that one up. Just don't go looking for that one. Although now that I've made it up, it's probably true. Yeah. Um, is it a problem? Um, I th well, that's a matter of opinion. There's two ways in which it's, uh, which I think it is a problem. Um, one is, one is uh, that David Icke should stop. Um, part of the reason why there's a lot of conspiracy-minded people in Gnosticism is because a lot of conspiracy-minded people watch a lot of David Icke, and David Icke has a concrete literalist interpretation of the Gnostic material to kind of say all these entities being talked about in this material are real existence that have physical physical being in the world and you should be terribly worried about them um and 
uh, all I've got to say about David Icke's uh, conspiracy theories is um, I gather he was a reasonably mediocre soccer player. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but he should stop. Uh, or, or people should stop paying him, one or the other, uh, because I think it's um, it's a complete pointless waste of everybody's time, including his. He should go and learn to paint or something, I think. Uh, so that's one way in which it's a problem, is it perpetuates the David Icke industrial complex. Um, the other way in which it's a problem, I think, uh, this is going to piss people off, but I came into the show intending to try to, you know, be as irritating as possible. So I'm going to do my best. Um, in New Zealand, uh, there is an academic research project called the Dunedin Study, and it's called that because it's in the city of, it's based in the city of Dunedin in, in New Zealand. And uh, the Dunedin Study is uh, one of the very few extremely long-term, longitudinal studies on the physical and psychological health of a cohort of people over a very long period of time, over multiple decades. Um, so they've recruited a bunch of, of kids um, at some point and with the family's consent, you know, and their ongoing consent as they've become adults, kind of followed them through the course of their lives and looked at their, you know, the circumstances of their birth and the circumstances of, um, of how they, you know, their experiences in life. It's a, it's a fairly large cohort of people and they're just kind of looking for patterns of what seems to lead to what, right? Yeah. So you can't, it's very hard to do controlled studies on this kind of thing. You can't sort of have one group that you don't intervene in and one group that you've intervened in because it's unethical. So longitudinal studies are one of the only ways you can try to establish causation around some of these things. And so that's, there's a few of these around the world, but the Dunedin one is, is particularly long-term and a fairly large cohort. So it's really interesting. So one of the things that came out recently was that the, uh, the folks that run the Dunedin study wondered how many people were in the um, sort of identified themselves as kind of or, or seemed to be in the group in the amongst the groups of people that took on conspiracies about COVID and and you know one world government and all that sort of stuff and the answer was there was a few in the in the cohort so could there is there a correlation between um they particularly looked at there's a scale on uh, of the uh clinicians use to kind of um, measure kind of where you kind of sit in the world of how much childhood trauma you experienced. So it's called the adverse childhood experience assessment. And it's just, it just counts, right? Like, did you as a child witness one or both of your parents struck by the other? Did you as a child witness um, multiple instances of Ill illicit substance abuse? Did you, were you as a child hit or beaten? Were you as a child sexually assaulted? Were you as, a, you know, so there's a list of things. And, and depending on how many of those boxes you tick, your ACEs score is higher or lower. And the point of it is to kind of go, I mean, people take it to kind of question, you know, was my childhood really difficult or not? And it's sometimes it's surprising to realize actually how many of those boxes you can tick. Um, it's quite a, quite a it's, it's worth looking up and trying. So the question they went in with was, there's, there's been a hunch that a lot of psychologists have had through this period that folks that are drawn to interpretations of the world where there's malign, cabals of malign others organizing themselves in order to personally destroy your life has a high correlation to high ACEs scores, um, lots of experience of childhood trauma. So the Dunedin study went to look at the data and kind of go, do those things seem to match? And the answer is yes, 80 to 90% correlation between adverse child, you know, high levels of adverse childhood experience and high adherence to these kinds of belief systems. So, um, I mean, I've got a third thing to say. I'm sorry, I'm banging on a no, fair bit. That's but, awesome. Go so on. the second way in which it's a problem is those sorts of experiences of childhood trauma um, fundamentally destabilize your sense of safety in the world. They fundamentally destabilize your sense of being loved and, and safe and cared for by the people around you. Um, and that leads some people to systems of belief that, that reinforce that. And conspiracy theories are one of those systems of belief. But unfortunately, I think Gnosticism is another one of those systems of belief. And so some people who come to Gnosticism come because they're drawn to this idea of a malign universe that's set up to make their life a living hell. Because their experience of their life often is a living hell. Um, and what they're after in that is a belief system that tells them that their experience is valid. Bingo. Fantastic. Um, but also tells them it's unalterable because the Demiurge and the Archons control the whole thing and there's no hope. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of cements you into this, this sense of, of, um, of, of being unable to change your circumstances. 
Um, and I totally understand that. I can totally understand why one would do that because honestly, if you've had early childhood trauma, I mean, the basic message of the, <laughs> sorry, some of this is um, a bit close to home for me, not personally, but people in my immediate world. Um, the, the image projected to you by Gnostic scripture is of a universe which is out to get you and it's not your fault. And really, if someone has come through multiple instances of childhood trauma and they're in adulthood and their life is pretty fucked up because it's really hard to get through that stuff without scars. Really, it's a good message. <laughs> it's a good message to hear that what's happened to you is not your fault. It could not have been your fault. Yeah. However, taking that on as a belief system and projecting those internal feelings out onto the cosmos um, isn't the way out. It can be affirming at a certain point in your journey of healing, but ultimately what's going to make the difference is actually seeking help from a almost universally from a qualified trauma therapist who's had experience in dealing with complex PTSD. Have we got a little, you know, <laughs> if, yeah. if you suffered from childhood trauma, here's a link. Maybe we can put some links in the show notes to, to resources for complex PTSD and stuff, but go find somebody to help. Don't keep reading Gnostic scripture and uh, believing that um, this is all inevitable. That's not a good way out. I had a third thing I was going to say, but I can't remember what it was now because I'd been crying. <laughs> You know, I, I think that uh, that that is beautifully said. And, you know, I, too, am moved because, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people also uh, in the same situation. And, and I suspect uh, a lot of us do. Right. So uh, belief yeah. systems ultimately don't help. Yeah, they can be affirming. You can find a, you can you can find a place where someone tells you that it's OK and you're right. And that's great. But you need to move on and you need to you need to you need to do the work of healing. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, you know, I have nothing to add, and and I think you're you're spot on, and I think you're spot on about where conspiracy theories ultimately come from and why they're so powerful, and a lot of the people that you know do do engage with them, and why why they have so much meaning uh, in people's lives, right? So, um, well, <laughs> that's uh, you know, I have nothing to add to that, but uh, but thank you so much. I, I think that was uh, both uh, spot on. Uh, and incredibly moving, and uh, I'll try to find some childhood trauma resources that I, I can put in the show notes. Okay, so it is time to finally wrap up. We almost made it to an hour and a half. We do have more questions, so please send more questions in. You know, I was doing one of these once a month. You know, I'll try to get back to that because I think it is important. Like, you, I'm not going to pretend that me and anybody else we have on these shows have all of the answers, right? But it, you know, I, I was saying this on a previous show. It's it's a line that I that I stole from from Monsignor uh, Jordan Stratford. But uh, I think Gnosticism is about asking better questions, you know. And we uh, perhaps perhaps we shouldn't be seeking answers, but we should be seeking ways to ask better questions. Um, you know, a little bit of Douglas Adams in there, right? They have the they have the the answer, the meaning, the answer to the meaning of life is forty two. But they don't know what the question is. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Plugs. Uh, go to uh, joeandite.org slash learn, and you can do Joe and I School or Yo and I School, however you want to say it. So it's an excellent free course uh, about the Joe and I tradition. And uh, it's super fun. It's super informative. Uh, Bishop Tim put it together, and it's pretty great. So check that out. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm doing too many plugs at the end of the show now. You know, people have probably turned it off, but these are great plugs, so so don't. Uh, GnosisForAll.com. It is a non-sectarian, independent website that is a collaborative effort from people across the Gnostic world, from uh, with a variety of different backgrounds, including um, you know, people who, who don't even consider themselves religious Gnostics, as far as I know. It's, it's, it's a great resource. Uh, you should check it out. I, I'm going to start hyping it up a little bit more, but they have an excellent page on conspiracy theories, uh, as well as just about everything else related to Gnosticism. So, so check that out. It's, it's a great project, uh, and I'm not directly involved but I am really happy to see it out there, kind of, kind of doing the good, the good work. So, um, join me for meditation. It's free. This is this is a lot of uh, mylandmeditation.substack.com every Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Uh, if you're ever in Montreal, you can check out my parish, holygrail.substack.com. 
Uh, I really like my school, gcast.ie. I'm doing research there about Gnosticism. So I don't know if you ever want to go to school and you like continental philosophy, religion, or uh, psychoanalysis, uh, it's a great place to do a, a degree. And if you don't want to go to school and study any of those things, you should check them out because they always have interesting programming on their YouTube channel, uh, great scholarly talks, uh, great one-off courses. Uh, so yeah. Uh, Bishop Tim, do you have any plugs? Nope. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I hope we can do this again soon. Uh, specifically this, uh, because I bet you the, the people who sent in questions were like, oh, I wish Bishop Tim had got into my question. Or when Jason peaced out, oh, I wish Jason and Bishop Tim had got into my question. And then they're all like, what if John's just going to do it by himself? Because I'm sick of hearing him answer. <laughs> I'm so <sure> that's <laughs> Anyway. Okay. Bye, everybody.